Well, good day. It's a genuine pleasure to be with you today at the launch of this well-evidenced and authoritative Creed report. Many reports cross my desk, both as a member of parliament and previously as a member for many years of the International Development Select Committee and the Human Rights Joint Committee in the UK Parliament, and now as the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. And often all that busy parliamentarians can do when we receive such a report is to skim the executive summary. However, this report was very different. It is rare that you can say that a piece of research grips you. But when this report reached me, I was gripped and I read it in full. And so the title of today's launch, The Evidence We Cannot Ignore, Religious Inequality and COVID-19 in India, Nigeria and beyond, is absolutely appropriate. Let me give you just three reasons. Firstly, we cannot ignore the real life evidence this report contains. The authors talk to members of religious minority communities in Nigeria and India, and it is their real life experiences that form the basis of this report and which can neither be ignored nor denied. The researchers talk to farmers, school support staff and teachers, those widowed during the pandemic, a seamstress, a blacksmith, someone working in a business centre, housewives, a tailor, food vendor, domestic workers, rickshaw drivers and others. And I want to thank these people, the participants, as well as the creed researchers for this report. Such work does not come without risks and particularly so during a pandemic and in some regions of physical insecurity. And conducting research with religious and belief minorities has to be done very sensitively. So I express my gratitude to all those involved and the valuable contribution this report will make towards consideration of the impact of the pandemic with particular reference to those in religious minority communities who are already suffering from the, the results of other inequalities such as poverty, gender or caste. And can I also pay my particular tribute and thanks to Maris Tadros for her leadership at Creed. A second reason why we cannot ignore this report is because of the compelling evidence, the way it's been used to undertake in-depth analysis and produce some clear findings across a number of sites. As Creed report, the report references the importance of recognizing that whilst all poor people, and I'm sure we would all agree the world over some not so poor, but while some particularly poor people have suffered extreme hardship as a consequence of the effects of COVID-19, when people are poor, and they simultaneously belong to religious minorities, they experience increased vulnerability, for example, on account of the social pressures they face when the majority ostracize them. And we read in this report of the direct attacks on freedom of religion or belief during the pandemic. The report says of Nigeria, and I quote, that there there were and are attacks on Christian villages during the pandemic which were religiously motivated, as manifested, for example, in the torching of places of worship. The report indicates that contrary to some reports, such attacks are not just a case of, for example, competition over resources or as a result of other drivers, but such attacks are targeted at those who are Christians. And so too, the report highlights, local politicians are perceived to deploy security forces and distribute aid along ethno-religious lines. Participants reported soldiers appear indifferent to their communities and fail to preempt or repel attacks. And so in India, the report tells us, Muslim participants were fearful to report discrimination for fear of reprisals revealing the scale of the issue. They revealed experiences of accusations of spreading COVID-19 
of harassment and of beatings. We also read of the poor and religious minority groups losing livelihoods and of course having little resilience when this happens and then having negligible access to government assistance. Although fortunately some support from churches and mosques were available as well as some interfaith cooperation and neighbourly care. That was good to read of. But sadly too, the report highlights that a main health impact of COVID-19 on religious minority groups living in poverty is on their mental health. This was so sad to read. We hear that in India, distress and despair due to hunger and loss of livelihoods during lockdown was acute amongst the Dalits and Hindus and amongst scapegoated Muslims now exhausted by targeting harassment and constant fear. And in Nigeria, the report speaks of the impact of violent attacks, loss of life and livelihoods during lockdown, promoting despair and depression amongst Christian respondents. And in need, indeed security as a lack of state protection is a highlighted theme in this report. It highlights well that increased security threats associated with government lack of attention to the safety of citizens disproportionately affects members of religious minorities. For example, the increased vulnerability of Muslim men in India and in Nigeria in those in certain geographic regions. Another aspect of the report which deeply concerned me was the impact on schooling and education. The loss of access to schooling for children being, as the report says, universal across all groups. Critical long-term impacts of COVID-19 will be seen by these young people and their families potentially over a lifetime and more, and is something which policymakers must take very seriously. So the Creed report highlights the importance of recognising intersecting inequalities and not just a blanket one, such as economic inequality, but how such inequalities come together to exacerbate suffering amongst the most vulnerable. And a third reason why this report cannot be ignored is because its conclusions and recommendations are so specific and practical. The Creed report states, greater sensitivity to these intersections, that is of poverty, gender, caste, and so forth, as well as being a member of a religious minority, greater sensitivity to these intersections is essential for the longer term recovery of these groups who otherwise face slipping deeper into intergenerational poverty with an associated proliferation of ethno-religious injustices, potentially fueling tensions and conflict. The report also says that the risk of neglecting these issues are immense and risk deepening marginalization. The practical recommendations are too many for me to refer to in full. And I recommend that all are carefully taken note of by policymakers. So I can but limit myself to giving examples here of a few. For example, the need for stronger community policing at local government and village levels. And the need for the safeguarding of this to be directed from the level of national governments where these issues occur in order to promote not only security, but also peace and conflict resolution. Re the recommendation to establish platforms to promote inter-religious dialogue and harmony is also important, as is the need to ensure that religious minority groups in poverty receive appropriate health provision and support and social safety nets, particularly, for example, widows and orphans. And that where livelihoods have been lost, alternative skills acquisition is promoted. Importantly, the report highlights the need for more support for local religious communities and institutions because they can so effectively and sensitively provide spiritual and mental help to individuals from religious communities. As the report says, international donors should be required to consider religious minorities in their approach to provide relief efforts in a pandemic which is far from over. And vulnerability criteria for aid should include religious vulnerability going forward. And so, in conclusion, I strongly recommend this report. I commend it. 
I am very pleased it was funded with John Bunyan money provided by the UK government following a recommendation in the Truro Review. But as I close, I remind myself and indeed all of us that such reports, although gripping reading, will only make a difference if they are used to inform policy and to help effect change in the lives of the people who are suffering. The effective use of excellent research and data like this is a challenge I posed only yesterday to officials in the FCDO during one of my regular reviews of progress on the Truro review recommendations. And so it is essential that we not only welcome and applaud this excellent report, but that we also use it effectively to inform policy. And Creed can be assured that I will continue to press for this, both generally with regard to strengthening the UK government's work on freedom of religion or belief, but also specifically with regard to this particular report, not least when I meet shortly with our Minister for Africa, the Right Honourable Vicky Ford MP. Once again, Creed, my thanks to everyone involved in the production of this report. Thank you so, so much. Uh, as you could see from the bio we've put in the chat function, we were very delighted, as you all know her, um, Fiona Bruce, the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Um, and we just want to also acknowledge, Fiona, that you were one of the first MPs to raise in Parliament how is COVID-19 affecting uh, people who belong to religious minorities globally. And not only did you raise it once, but you persisted and you consistently and, 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 and constantly asked, but what about them? What about them? Are we also taking religious inequalities into our into our formula, into our big picture? Um, so we're very, very grateful that you are with us today. We are extremely grateful that in the middle of an extremely busy schedule, you have read the report in its entirety. Uh, it is it, it, it sets the bar to, for MPs very, very high in terms of uh, engaging with research and um, we're just very grateful that you will also be able to take forward the translation of, of policy recommendations into action points moving forward. Um, so thank you very, very much. And um, a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today. We are delighted to have you with us. And if you have questions um, for Fiona, she will be with us until three o'clock. So perhaps you may want to prioritize questions to her um, first. And then, of course, uh, we will be staying on until half past three uh, for other questions to our uh, panelists. Um, just to very briefly uh, share with you, the, the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development um, is uh, a consortium that provides research evidence and practical program delivery to redress poverty, hardship, and exclusion resulting from discrimination on the grounds of religion or belief. Um, so far, we have reached over 33,000 direct beneficiaries, excluding the indirect beneficiaries um, within the space of two and a half years because the first year was one we were co-constructing the program uh, with our partners locally. Um, as mentioned, Creed is a consortium that is convened by the Institute of Development Studies but governed by a set of partners or with partners um, including uh, El Khoi Foundation, Minority Rights Group and Refsemi which is led by Archbishop Engelos and um, we also have about 30 to 40 partners in various countries that are part of the consortium consortium and engage directly with it. Um, we also want to acknowledge that this is funded by UK Aid, and we are very grateful um, to the FCDO for uh, funding this study. Um, I also want to start by uh, saying an enormous thank you to my colleague, Dr. Joe Howard, who is the cluster leader for the participation, inclusion and social change uh, um, team, which is like a department uh, at the Institute of Development Studies. She was the lead, uh, uh, um, the, the lead researcher and the PI for this study for both India and covering both countries methodologically. And we're just so grateful for her leadership on this. Um, and um, just want to say this research is based on empirical data that was undertaken between November 20 and March 2021. And it was specifically to explore the direct and indirect effects of COVID-19 on religiously um, marginalized groups in Nigeria and India. 
And uh, Dr. Joe Howard uh, worked in collaboration with a team uh, that was led in India by Professor Funmi, um, who leads the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. And may I just say on this point, Professor Funmi is the first woman ever to lead the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. So we're just very very delighted to have partnered with her on this. And uh, Professor Funmi's team in Nigeria also included Dr. Planksat, whom we've had the privilege of working with in IDS for many years uh, on the Action for Empowerment and Accountability program. And uh, also as part of the team, uh, Dr. Kasholom, Dr. Henry, Dr. Dauda, who we are very privileged is with us today and will speak. Um, and Dr. Uh, Rahina, Aishatu, Solomon, and Siraj. Uh, this is for the Plateau team. In the Kaduna team, Dr. Philip, Dr. Chikas, uh, Christine and Ketung, uh, and Hawa and Dr. Mariam, um, Kabiro and Abdel Rahman. We have been very honored uh, to work with them. Um, and now this is where the surprise comes in, because you will find blank when it comes to the, the, the names of the India team. The India team was led by this amazing professor. Uh, um, and uh, with the professor, there was a large number of academics and NGO practitioners. But because of the level of encroachments on people's right to express themselves, to critique the Indian government, they were too scared that by appearing in this, um, in, uh, by being acknowledged as they are supposed to uh, in this paper and by participating with their identities uh, made, um, well, made visible to the Indian government that there would be a crackdown ag with, against the NGOs with which they work and against them as academics. And it's a sad story when the encroachment on academic freedom press freedom and civil society space to do its work in creating a more humane society is so under threat that people cannot come and, and be acknowledged and, and share directly. But we, we, we are in solidarity with them. And of course, out of duty of care, uh, Dr. Joe Howard uh, has been asked by the head of the India team to present the India um, res the, the results of the India work on her behalf. Now, the, the topic of the impact of COVID-19 on, um, uh, sorry, the impact of COVID-19 on inclusion more broadly and specifically as it affects religious minorities uh, is one that, as mentioned, uh, Fiona Bruce has repeatedly raised in Parliament. But we also want to acknowledge the excellent work done by others in this area, in particular the All Parliamentary Group on Freedom of Religion or Belief, who have produced an excellent global study. I would also like to give uh, recognition to the work of CSW, CSI, Open Doors, and many others who have produced excellent work um, in documenting the impact of COVID on religious inequalities. Also, um, a very, very important report that shows the link between freedom of original belief and people's daily lives for the poor, in particular, Dr. Ahmed Shahid Heed's report on safeguarding freedom of original belief um, for the successful implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was uh, released uh, a year ago in 2020 and is widely and readily available. It's an excellent report. Um, so how does our report complement this work? I think the key issue that we are trying to engage with um, is the approach is that the process of gathering the data is just as important as the data itself. We undertook this research through participatory methodologies that Dr. Joe Howard will explain in depth. But the key issue here is to understand the day-to-day -day sufferings of people and how bit by bit their opportunities, their choices, what they are experiencing is being encroached upon such that we don't need to wait until things fully materialize into a genocide or fully materialize into pogroms for us to act. What this is showing us is 
how, how people who are in positions of vulnerability on account of poverty and intersecting inequalities are increasingly being squeezed in very, very dangerous ways. And I want to stop there, but before I stop there, I just want to say there's one takeaway message that builds on the important key messages that Fiona has raised and which will colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Joe and colleagues, uh, Professor Fonmi and others will, will share with you. But the one key message that was particularly um, concerning or raised major alarm bells for me for both studies combined was the intergenerational transfer, not only of poverty, but of ruptures in social cohesion. Because we know that um, that COVID-19 has amplified gender inequalities, has amplified the divide between the wealthy and the poor and so forth. But when we are transmitting and, 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 and uh, passing on to the next generation, um, more divides across communities, across individuals, the social fabric of society is being ruptured. And that unfortunately create, paves the way or creates fertile ground for a great deal of um, uh, uh, hearsay and rumors and uh, uh, blaming across communities. And, and it does not bid well for those kind of inequalities that then create fertile ground for violence. So um, let us put an end to the, to the transfer of intergenerational ruptures and social cohesion before it's too late. Now, um, I'm going to now um, pass on to uh, Dr. Ahmed Shahid, who uh, could not join us in person at this time, unfortunately, because of the uh, we've had to reschedule our seminar, so he couldn't be with us. But Dr. Ahmed Shahid is the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief um, and Deputy Director of the Essex Human Rights Center. And he has very graciously um, uh, read the report and recorded a message that uh, he wants to share with you all. So, um, Dr. Ahmad Shahid, thank you for being with us in spirit and thank you for your recording. And without much ado, uh, I will pass on to Dr. Ahmad Shahid. Okay, uh, I'm going to share the video if you just bear with me. I need to share my screen. Apologies, I'm not sure what that was. Let me just have another look for the... Uh... Good afternoon. I am grateful to Creed, especially to Professor Maurice Chadros, for inviting me to say a few words at the launch of two key reports on India and on Nigeria, tracking the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on religious minorities. I also want to congratulate the authors of these excellent reports that not only enhance our understanding of the severe impacts caused by the pandemic, but also provide useful guidance for policymakers. And as I will suggest in a moment, the insights in these two reports point to the need for further normative clarification or elaboration of the human rights framework regarding religious freedom. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to devastate lives and exert a high toll on all communities worldwide. 
some of the impacts of the pandemic are quite obvious and have been well documented. But there are also effects that do not immediately become apparent, including lifelong changes and intergenerational impacts. It has of course been clear to many that the pandemic is more than a public health catastrophe and that it demands carefully designed and diligently delivered measures, not just in the health sector, but across all aspects of life. A pandemic of this scale and duration will undeniably have multiple intersecting impacts that aggravate the consequences of every dimension of inequality and vulnerability. And as these carefully researched documents demonstrate, it has reinforced pre-existing inequalities and vulnerability. This we have seen around the world as an extension of the challenges that duty bearers face in addressing concerns in private spheres, who has effects of extensive restrictions on various freedoms and rights that have undermined the agency and autonomy of individuals. Where the state fails to respect, protect and promote the agency of individuals, the most vulnerable suffer the worst. Just as there are overlaps in the vulnerability of persons and groups, the failure of the state to discharge obligations to respect, protect and promote human rights also leads to multiplier effects. In a world where religious identity is becoming increasingly salient, intolerance and discrimination based on their belief can also have multiple overlapping impacts that increase the vulnerability of communities exposed to such intolerance. The question before us then is what can we do to address this perfect storm as it were of intersectional vulnerability linked to religious identity? Responding to the compounding effects of multiple vulnerabilities requires mobilizing synergies amongst those who may have been previously working in silos. I have been speaking about the necessity of such interdisciplinary, multi-faith and cross-boundary approaches, including developing unusual collaborations. The goal is not only to harness synergies or to pool efforts and resources, but also to address politicization and identity-based politics that undermine human rights work. These trends can be even more pronounced when efforts are made to address indirect discrimination, which often go against majoritarian or populist sentiment. In several of my UN reports, I've highlighted examples of good practice, such as community level collaborative projects that builds societal resilience. In some reports, I have dealt directly with addressing intersectionality. In addition to harnessing synergies, crucial to addressing intersectionality is advancing the agency of rights holders. This requires some background conditions, such as respect for the rule of law. In addition, it calls for a targeted and participatory approach that responds to the lived realities of specific groups, rather than looking for downloadable and generic solutions. There are tools within the UN system that can support such a targeted, participatory and inclusive approach, sometimes called the policy or operational approach to implementing human rights on the ground. Essential to this approach is the engagement of the rights holders in determining the objective and subjective measures of the enjoyment of their rights. This approach also involves identifying specific elements or attributes of each right, for example, equality before the law or of justice, which are fundamental to enjoying freedom of religion or belief, as the reports from Nigeria and India demonstrate. This methodology, which focuses on indicators linked to structure, process, and the outcome, is particularly well suited to addressing intersectional aspects of vulnerability. It seeks the participation of rights holders, it can empower them, clarify state obligations, create more transparency, make progress more measurable, and enable accountability. This approach can be very usefully incorporated into the pursuit of the SDGs. It is also consistent with the long standing commitment of the UN to mainstreaming human rights. However, both these frameworks, of course, need to engage with the full spectrum of human rights covered under freedom of the general belief to which, which to that has been lagging. I just want to highlight that these reports that we are launching today speak glaringly to the need to clarify or elaborate the normative understanding we have of freedom of the general belief. It will be 40 years next week since the UN last formulated in some detail its understanding of freedom of the general belief. The 1981 UN Declaration, the elimination of all forms of intolerance and of discrimination based on religion or belief. The Declaration provides a very important insight in Article 2, 
by linking intolerance based on religion or belief to any form of discrimination, in intent or effect that undermines the enjoyment of any human right, economic, social, cultural, political or civil. The principles and commitments in this article draw among others on the commitment to non-discrimination article two of the two covenants. As Creed's work has shown in these two reports and elsewhere, there is a need to examine carefully the application of the 1981 declaration, including in regard to hidden forms of discrimination. I also want to add that it is also time for a more explicit recognition or elaboration of the commitment made in the common article three in the two covenants on the equal entitlement of women and men to the enjoyment of all human rights. Realizing this commitment is crucial to addressing some of the most widespread intersectional impacts we have seen during the pandemic, especially striking form where there is rampant intolerance as these two reports testify. Engaging with this global commitment goes hand in hand with the SDGs. It will be crucial to advancing the autonomy and agency of all right holders, with enabling human rights movement to transcend many silos and to mobilize synergies. In concluding, I want to again pay tribute to all who contributed to the two reports before us. I look forward to further engagement on the issues raised in these two reports. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we are now going to move straight uh, to Dr. Joe Howard, who led the, the report. And um, I think Dr. Joe, uh, Dr. Ahmad was talking about the importance of understanding the intersections. And you have been working on issues of um, people on the margins who experience intersecting inequalities, exclusions for, for 30 years. So um, what has this report, what has working on the intersection of religious inequality with other inequalities meant to you? And um, what struck you? So about the use of participatory methods um, uh, as, uh, as they applied in these cases. So Dr. Joe, without uh, further ado, over to you. And for those that want to know who Dr. Joe Howard is, um, I think Emily has very kindly already put um, the information in the chat function. Over to you. Thank you so much. And um, what a great privilege to follow the speakers that have already um, shared their thoughts this afternoon. And I feel that, Fiona, thank you so much. You made such a remarkably complete and thoughtful summary of our research. I really appreciate what your words and your appreciation of, of the work that went, in, went into it. And I think you did an a, a fantastic job of highlighting some of the key findings and recommendations. So I wanted to um, briefly talk a little bit about how we went about the research and why we did it that way um, before we hear more specifically from the Nigeria team and, and then back to myself representing the India team. And I would like to share a couple of slides. Um, they're mainly to give you um, a couple of images from the research to bring it to life a little bit. Um, so I will attempt to do that and not catapult you into some surprising um, um, YouTube video. So, um, I hope you're seeing my, my screen well. Yep, great, fantastic. So I, I won't read through the names again, but I wanted to start with a recognition of all of the team that behind this work. And while I'm speaking on their behalf, um, of course, my, my role was, was marginal compared to those researchers who were there on the ground doing the work. Um, and using the participatory methods in very difficult circumstances. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so the research that, that P Professor Tadros and, and Fiona has wonderfully introduced has uncovered a critical intersection of vulnerabilities where faith or caste and gender intersect with extreme poverty, creating higher levels of insecurity during the pandemic for religious minorities. And and it's, it's been highlighted that greater sensitivity to these intersections is essential for the longer term recovery of these groups. And the, the research is showing how otherwise and they are already slipping deeper into what could turn into intergenerational poverty and exclusion. Um, 
It's clear that also that the pandemic has exacerbated existing inequities and threatens ambitions um, for those furthest behind to be reached and supported through the SDGs. And this is such a critically important thing to consider. So I come to this research with 30 years of experience of accompanying, accompanying marginalized people in participatory processes in different parts of the world to express and analyze their experiences of marginalization and to share, but not only to tell their stories of marginalization, by, new, no, by no means only that, but to share ideas, um, to, to find mutual support and plan action for influencing change. Bringing this experience to engage with people from religious minorities, as I was invited to work with Creed, has clarified to me that we were often missing religion and faith as a crucial dimension of people's experience, tending to focus rather on poverty, gender, ethnicity, disability. And that's not to diminish those in any way, but to recognize um, religious religion and faith as as crucial dimensions of people's identities and experiences and also for people's approach to development and their own development. It also confirms that bringing participatory action research to research into religious inequalities, it respects people's realities, but it also, it also builds their ownership of the research and so is less extractive and it provides rich insights. So I came to this research with a commitment to better understand intersecting inequalities, which I've been working on for some time, from the perspective of religious minorities in India and Nigeria. And engaging with people of religious minorities has been enlightening and humbling for me and on a number of levels. Firstly, that the lives of the people we engaged with were extraordinarily hard hit by the pandemic. We became aware of loss of livelihoods in, increased insecurity as the state's capacity was diverted, domestic violence exacerbated by privations and economic hardship, the list goes on. And it was remarkable and humbling how the local researchers in Nigeria and India took on these methods that I trained them in and via Zoom due to lockdown, and most had not had previous experiences of participatory methods, but they, they were up to, they were, they took it on, they practiced them, they reflected together, we discussed and adapted them in some ways, and they took on the challenge. And I'm so appreciative that they, of, of, of their efforts and remarkable um, uh, strength in doing this, because their experiences were often hard. In some settings, 200 people instead of 20 arrived for the research activity, desperately hoping for food assistance which of course was not, um, not possible. In both countries, researchers heard stories of hardship, social isolation and scapegoating, humiliation, attacks, violence and persecution. It was not an easy job to do. But I also became aware of the importance and comfort that people's faith brings them. We looked for the factors that were driving their, their, the challenges and the difficulties, but we also asked about enabling factors. And for, the, and for most, their faith was the most significant en enabling factor that helped them, was helping them through. The methods enhanced that we used, you saw one on the previous slide, which was the river of life, someone narrating in Nigeria, uh, um, uh, a participant in Kaduna was um, narrating his river of life. So we used two methods. Firstly, each, each participant drew or created their own river or road of life as a visual tool to help them to each tell the story of their life over the last 18 months. We wanted to do this kind of as a timeline so we, we could understand a bit about their experiences prior to the pandemic and during and, during, and in the shadow of COVID-19. And participants were able to express their situation, as the researcher from Kaduna said, in surprisingly fantastic ways, mostly using the river or road of life. And second, and so, um, and other, the, here's a river of life with fishes in it, which is one of the India, um, from one of the Indian participants. Secondly, as the, each participant presented their river or road of life, and then there was a group discussion, 
and an exercise where people went deeper into the issues. They asked about why things were occurring and ranked the issues that were coming out through uh, what's called a PRA or participatory rural appraisal matrix ranking exercise to identify the most pressing issues. And we were, it was very clear that participatory research in its need, emphasis on the need to reflect on and attend to ethics in context was really important because here we were working in context of great insecurity. And this clarified the importance of building trust with participants and of working with local organizations that the participants themselves trusted and of, and of having flexibility, for example, to offer individual or small group interviews in order to deepen stories with those who were reluctant or frightened to speak in a group. But on the whole, the group dynamic was such and facilitated so well that people gained confidence and were able to share their stories, however difficult, and to support each other through that process. So participatory methodologies enabled our enhanced understanding of the lived realities of religious minorities in India and Nigeria. The participatory methods we employed enable people to talk about issues from their own perspectives and through visual as well as verbal media. This is important because it generated data which cut across research categories and gave voice to concerns that people may well have otherwise or would have otherwise kept silent about because of fear or shame. And as this quote illustrates on the slide, uh, a woman said she, she always tries not to talk about the, the difficulty. She doesn't want to affect other people, but was able to, to really open up and, and break down during the group exercise. The data that was generated and analysed by the participants themselves enhances our understanding of the ways in which the discrimination and insecurity experienced by people of religious minorities living in poverty during COVID are creating short and longer term negative impacts in their health, their access to education, their economic opportunities, their security, and in particular, it highlights the terrible combined impact of economic hardship with fear and humiliation through marginalization and stigmatization because of their faith or religion. So our, our research approach enabled the stakeholders and people on the ground to own the research. The issues came up organ organically from the group, issues that you might not have identified before and faith came up as a very key issue. The approach was successful in, ga in engaging mar marginalized and frightened people in contexts where there may be antipathy towards external, donor, donor, sorry, external donors and researchers coming in with an agenda, as it might be seen. But people opened up and this worked because of the methodology and because of the excellent way that the methodology was implemented by the researchers in those contexts. Face-to-face -face research was achieved in very difficult circumstances and people told us what was really going on. They wept and cried and told us their realities at the height of the pandemic. So this research for me has confirmed the importance of a grounded participatory research approach with religious minorities because it builds trust and respect while generating data which is rooted in the complexity of people's lived experiences. And it's so important for the criteria that we use in research to be owned and managed by people who are experiencing it themselves and not imposed. We also feel the profound importance of bringing these perspectives to decision makers through these policy briefings. And that's where I'd like to end for the moment on the research approach. Let me stop sharing. Thank you very, very much, Professor Fumi. We really appreciate, uh, sorry, Prof uh, Dr. Joe Howard, we really appreciate um, this, in, uh, this overview of the methodology, which we hope will be relevant to colleagues, uh, whether they are working in Nigeria or India or beyond. I think in our case, in Creed, we have uh, used this methodology in Iraq and Egypt. Um, as well, and it has proved to also um, uh, reveal layers of 
um, what people are experiencing in their own words that complements other approaches to understanding hardship and inequality. Um, as you probably noticed, Professor Fumi was on my mind. So without uh, further ado, um, uh, thank you again, Dr. Uh, Joe Howard. We will uh, now hear a, a pre-recording from Professor Fumi, who um, was our uh, collaborating lead for Nigeria. And uh, she will speak to the the inequalities that were amplified in uh, parts of Nigeria that were that are Christian majority, um, and because uh, Professor Fumi wasn't quite uh, sure whether there would be internet issues, we are going to hear a pre-recording. But she is with us, and she will be able to ask to answer any questions um, you may have. So um, over to Emily, who will actually put on the recording for us. But Professor Fulmi is here for the uh, Q&A component. Thank you again, Dr. Joe. I'm very sorry, <clears throat> just bear with me. I thought um, Professor Fulmi would be talking, so I just need to bring up the video, if you just give me a minute. Professor Fulmi, would you prefer to, to to uh, take the e-platform or would you prefer that we put on the recording? Uh, the recording, please. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, it's good. Now we have, we've, uh, we, we, we have uh, Emily just taking uh, seconds to uh, have it up. Um, in the meantime, because uh, um, uh, Fiona Bruce uh, will need to leave us at three, um, I think we will we will take uh, Professor Fonmi's intervention and then we will pause for five minutes um, and take any questions in the Q&A and then resume again um, with Dr. Dauda, who we are very, very keen on hearing from as he will also speak to areas of Nigeria where Muslims are a minority uh, politically or demographically and how they have also experienced the impact of COVID-19. So are we ready, Emily? Shall I, shall I pass on to you? Sorry, right, I'm trying to unmute and bring up the video at the same time. It's a multitasking challenge that was, was on me at that point. Um, okay, so let's see if we can get this up and running again. And while Emily, um, Emily sets it up, just to say that uh, this will all be available um, um, online tomorrow. And if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, do so, because then you will get it into uh, your uh, mailbox without having to uh, search for it. So, um, Emily, uh, over to you now. The states had been sort of intense ethno-religious violence over the past two decades, particularly uh, since 1999, when Nigeria returned to democratic governance. Uh, since then, there has been a lot of um, communal and identity-based uh, conflict, particularly around religious and ethnic identity. Now, if you within that context, um, enters uh, 2020 COVID and um, all the measures taken by the federal government at that time, and even state governments to deal with COVID through lockdown measures and uh, distribution of palliatives. Now, within this context, this research tried to investigate how or what was the extent or the nature of the impact of COVID, particularly on vulnerable groups around religious identity, particularly issues related to religious uh, inequality, as well as uh, the, its intersection with other, other identities, such as uh, gender, age, uh, socioeconomic status, and what have you. Um, both Christians and Muslims in, tho in those states have a perception of being um, uh, discriminated against, both by the central government, as well as by 
uh, the state government, more so Christians in Kaduna and more so Muslims in Plateau. So they, they provided a very uh, rich and robust uh, test case for a, an investigation into the effects or the impacts of COVID-19 uh, around these uh, identity axes. So uh, when you look at the findings, the findings uh, confirmed that both Christians and Muslims, particularly women and children, uh, uh, underwent very severe impacts of COVID-19. And these, these effects were largely around being able to uh, access uh, healthcare, um, uh, issues to do with livelihood. Most of these people are either based in rural areas or they are urban poor um, based uh, persons. Now, all this is within the context of also overriding uh, movement, transhumanist movements from the, the, the Maghreb, the Sahel, down through Nigeria. And this is also part of the Nigeria's historical context. And so during COVID, uh, COVID lockdown, there were restrictive movements, but the, these uh, uh, people, these uh, farmers, these transhumans continued. And so farms came under increasing pressure from attacks. People's crops were, uh, uh, were vandalized, you know, post -har I mean, harvest losses and so, ma so many things. And because of that, there was serious pressure on already existing poverty in these areas. So poverty was exacerbated among already vulnerable communities. So that's one of the most severe impacts. The other one was, you know, the, the suspicions, mutual suspicions that existed between Christians and Muslims pre-COVID were exacerbated post-COVID or during COVID. Most people, most respondents during the, during the research, both Christians and Muslims felt that government didn't respond adequately to the needs that arose during, during COVID, particularly for those people in the urban areas who are seasonal workers and depend on their livelihoods on a daily basis, and those people in the rural areas who were at risk of having either their cattle rustled on the case in the part of the Fulani Muslims or the house and the house of Muslims and those um, indigenous Christian communities who were constantly at risk of being attacked you know uh, on their farms on the way to their farms or their farms uh, being uh, vandalized. Um, another impact was that gender-based violence and their statistical evidence both in terms of um, government reporting at uh, hospitals, um, response centers, the police. And during this research, it was clear from the responses of, of, our, of, of our respondents, our research participants, that gender-based violence was exacerbated or increased during COVID lockdowns. Now, to a large extent, I would say that uh, this was fairly equal equal among both Christians and Muslims, although there was a, a slightly greater reporting of gender-based violence among uh, uh, Christian communities. Uh, let me speak more to the Christian communities because I know somebody else will be speaking about the Muslim communities. Uh, Christian women felt that um, they were compelled, particularly those who were in um, uh, displacement camps, they were compelled to exchange sex for money to feed their children. Uh, they were compelled uh, beyond giving sexual favors. They were compelled to, you know, labor uh, much harder uh, because they had they, they had uh, to care for the the young, the sick, and the elderly. Um, another um, finding that I think is important: or in, inadequate state response, or the failure to carry people along to let them know what government was doing, how government was doing it, and who government was reaching. Such that most Christians in Kaduna State, in particular, felt that they were victimized in the distribution of COVID-19 palliatives. Um, you will see from the policy brief that Muslims also had the same feeling, but in, in a different sense, probably in a different way. Um, during that time, there were agitations by the youth uh, for access to palliatives. And in fact, there was a, a, a widespread protest that led to loss of life. To a very large extent, um, most Christians, most Muslims uh, felt that uh, there was a, a breach of public trust. So they, they felt that government was not for them. Uh, government was not for anyone. And so there was this alienation between 
the people and governments. And I think that's uh, something that uh, really was very clear in, 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 in the findings. So on the basis of these issues, these four issues, uh, the policy brief or this uh, this research made a couple of recommendations and these recommendations were both to the federal government and to the subnational governments but in general the recommendations revolve around increasing voice and participation in the process of governance in what government is doing and then also uh, secondly ensuring that policies government policies are, are gender sensitive but they also respect and acknowledge the intersection of identities, you know, across across ethnicity, religion, gender, age, and socioeconomic status, the need for policies to be responsive and sensitive to the diverse identities of of of, of the citizenry. Um, another uh, recommendation that that I think is very key is that in the long term, it's important for the Nigerian government to develop response mechanisms uh, to emergencies whether they be health emergencies or dis other disasters, or that there's need for a structural approach to addressing uh, emergencies and, 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 and people's vulnerabilities. And this is something that has to, have, has to come through a, stake a stakeholder engagement approach and also an approach to you know, prioritizing good governance or even good enough governance, as some would argue, such that when there, when there are uh, pandemics or when there are emergencies and and um, disasters, there is an inherent resilience in the people. So ensuring that people are able to build back better or bounce back better from, um, from disasters or from emergencies is really, really critical, really, really essential. Uh, I think ultimately, um, thank thank the, you, Professor Funmi. Uh, uh, Alice, can you kindly, you will have the full film of Professor Funmi on Alice. Um, you have the full film of Professor Funmi on, um, um, on the YouTube and will be accessible tomorrow. And of course, Professor Funmi is with us to answer questions. We have about a couple of minutes before uh, Fiona needs to go. I just wondered whether anybody would like to ask her questions very quickly um, before she before she has to unfortunately go to another meeting. Um, any queries for Professor Fulmi kindly put in the chat function um, and we will uh, we will we'll just uh, give you all another couple of seconds um, and then we will say thank you to uh, Professor Fulmi for we have one message I'm just sorry just opening it uh, no that's that's a uh, 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 a message, a different kind of message. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Joe, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wanted to just jump in with a question which I think I would like to ask from my, on behalf of my Indian colleagues, because you won't hear the, the short Indian presentation. So forgive me for, for bringing it up front, but it's the challenge for um, faith-based organizations in India that they're facing so many restrictions and challenges and uh, restrictions to funding that how can we support faith-based organizations to support the poorest and most marginalized of their constituencies and so I would like to ask you that question or have you go away with that thought please about what um, what the British government might do in that um, uh, to that end. Thank you very much. I'm afraid you're muted. Apologies, I, uh, I thought I was unmuting when I muted. Um, yes, it's a very important question. Um, there are obviously issues, uh, legislative concerns and judicial concerns. And I, I want to reassure you that the HMG, our government, takes these very seriously. And wherever possible, for example, Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, our human rights uh, minister, will raise these um, with his counterparts in the Indian government. And I think we have to continue to do that. But we also also have to, and I know the British High Commission does this in, uh, in New Delhi, um, and uh, the Deputy High Commissions do in India, we have to work as closely as possible with Indian civil society and NGOs so that we really do understand the awareness 
of the impact of, of these uh, issues. And then we can do more to support those who are impacted by them, uh, survivors of the, um, the effect of, of these restrictions. So please do be aware that the FCDO is very sensitive to these, if you like, diverse drivers of human rights abuses, um, is wanting to work with minority communities. And uh, I, I know from my own experience, and I speak not just uh, regarding India, but more broadly, um, I have written to uh, almost all of our posts, our diplomatic posts across the world now, uh, and I am very encouraged with their responses and how they are increasingly uh, looking at freedom of religion or belief as something they need to consider and work with local communities on. But I think what your report has done is to really highlight that that needs to be seen in the context of other vulnerabilities. And, and I hope that um, your report, uh, and I'm no doubt Maris will, uh, will request this um, through her contacts in the FCGO. I hope this report is actually sent to all of our diplomatic posts, because I think across the world, bearing in mind this is a world pandemic, there is something we can all learn from it and hopefully work better together as a result. Uh, thank you for your question, Joe. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your work. And thank you, Maris, for allowing me the privilege of being involved in this very important launch today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much, Fiona. Much appreciate you being with us today and much appreciate uh, your uh, energizing commitments. And uh, so wish you all the best uh, with, with your continued work in uh, making visible the invisible forms of inequalities that people are experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. So, uh, much, much appreciate you being with us. So now we will move to uh, uh, hear Dr. Dauda, and um, we already have some questions coming in to Professor Funmi and others. So I'm sure we'll also see more questions coming in after Dr. Dauda's presentation. You will see uh, Dr. Dauda's bio in the chat, uh, which uh, uh, I think Alice is very kindly um, putting now. Um, so you all have um, you hear about all his amazing accomplishments. And Dr. Dado, again, we are really delighted to have you with us. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also happy to be with you and thank you for the opportunity. I think I will just follow up on, on what uh, Professor uh, Fumi has uh, discussed and also give some examples from the field since we were the ones that were on the field. Now, my, what I'm going to discuss is about the marginalized Muslim community in Northern Nigeria. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Joe has already given the, uh, an information about the research team. So I will go ahead and, uh, and, dis and give a little background about the situation even before COVID-19. Um, the, the Muslim community in Northern Nigeria, I mean, in, in Jaws, uh, are already um, facing some form of discrimination because, for instance, in the area of education, they are already backward, and also this affects their engagement with uh, with hospitals. For instance, most of the hospitals are owned by by either by the government or they are privately owned by by Christians. So it sometimes, especially. The, the interviews they have expressed this a lot where Muslim women are really discriminated against in these hospitals uh, because most of them don't speak English. So it becomes a problem for them. Now with this background and with this fear within the, um, the, 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 the Muslims, especially women, um, when they, with the coming of COVID, it intensifies because the, the because of the fear that if they go to hospitals, even if they don't have COVID, they suspect that maybe because of this enmity, because of this challenge, they are likely going to be um, announced that they have COVID and that scared them from hospitals. Um, but also, um, I think we should, it's important to understand that the impact of COVID was really 
Um, there are a lot of views about that in, in, in Northern Nigeria and mostly Muslim, the Muslim community suspect that um, most people in the Muslim community see that COVID is just a Western thing. So there is no serious belief on, on, uh, on, on COVID. Uh, but then, so most people resort to like um, treatment, uh, home treatment. When we ask them, how do they do that? They said, for instance, using hubs rather than going to hospitals. Um, yes, then uh, in addition, uh, another challenge that really happens because we also look at the Fulani Muslim minorities at Basa, which is a neighboring community to just not, um, who also have similar challenges. Um, uh, they, they, they find it difficult to, to go to hospitals, and also the lockdown has also complicated issues. Uh, but then uh, this brought the issue of also increasing poverty within the, the community, whereby um, a lot of people do not have what to fit on. Uh, a lot of um, uh, men cannot find what to feed their, their, their families. It becomes a serious challenge. Uh, a lot of young people do not have what to feed. In fact, uh, one of the participants told us that a young, they met a group of uh, young people who told them that um, they, they, they are meeting to go out and, and collect whatever they could from people because of the desperate situation they found themselves. Now, um, uh, following up on, on this, uh, most of the Muslims in Jaws felt that government is not doing um, adequately in assisting them, and they suspect that government is only interested in assisting the, uh, the Muslim community. For instance, the chairman of Mieti Allah in, uh, uh, in the uh, Basa community told us that they only see trucks passing by their community, which they suspect they are going to the uh, Christian community. Um, of course, Christians also complain the inadequacy of government, but these are polarized communities that have already, um, that, that have already have their own notion of, uh, about the government, about the state. Now, another issue that also, um, really challenge the Muslim community is the issue of education because, for instance, um, already, like I said earlier, uh, Muslims are a little backward about education in northern Nigeria entirely. But then with the lockdown, uh, most children don't go to school, and that posed a lot of challenge for the for the for, for a lot of people. And so when we ask them how uh, do they cope with this situation, uh, like Irikos, an area that is dominated by the Muslims, uh, a part of that area said that they went around to look for teachers among themselves who take the responsibility of teaching uh, their children. But the challenge is that not many people also send their children to the school. Now, another issue that confronted the community is the issue of insecurity, whereby there is increase in, in, in insecurity, um, uh, street uh, thieves, street robbers, um, uh, where we increase within the society. Like for instance, uh, one of the participants told me that, uh, told us during the interview sessions that um, he, was, he is always not comfortable going out to even the monks to pray within their own vicinity because of the fear that someone might uh, might come into uh, his house and pro probably harm his family. So this is the, the, the issues and this is um, uh, what how COVID has affected the, the Muslim community. There are other areas uh, uh, of impact, but um, time will not... Uh, Allow me, I have only five minutes, and I think my, my five minutes is off. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Dauda. It's, um, you've raised some very, very important points about perception and the role of perception in influencing 
people's uh, sense of reality when there is so much scarcity and hardship. And I think there's also a question that has come uh, to Professor Fonmi on the, the, the link, the, 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 the disconnect between reality and perception, which I think we would also like to share with you. Um, straight after, we hear very briefly from Dr. Uh, Joe Howard on the India study, because I think for us it was very important that there is this comparative perspective. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Howard will kindly share with us some of the findings from India, and then we will go, um, we will go straight into Q&A. Uh, Dr. Joe, over to you. Thank you so much, Maurice. Um, I will try to be brief so we have time for Q&A. Um, so just um, as you already know, I'm speaking on behalf of a tremendous team um, who I, I hugely appreciate their courage and commitment in undertaking this research, particularly where it's so challenging and, um, and potentially dangerous for them to do so. And in India, the, the research was undertaken with religi religious minorities living in urban slums in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka states in India. And inquiry groups were held with groups of Christian and Muslim men and women, and with comparator groups of Dalit Hindu women and men. And as we've already discussed, we found cr the critical intersection of vulnerabilities through faith, scheduled caste identity and other identities um, and extreme poverty, which are deeply concerning. And the data that was generated and analyzed by these groups themselves brought to light how their experiences of poverty, exclusion, discrimination and harassment were amplified during the pandemic. And that's led to significant mental health and potential intergenerational impacts, which has been raised already. And I'd just like to very briefly highlight three, three major areas of concern and two key recommendations. And I will share screen, but again, just to give you a little flavor of um, some direct voices. So I'll quickly do that. Um, so firstly, um, is the, uh, our concern is about deepening, increasing poverty and exclusion. And the lockdown led to high levels of loss of livelihoods amongst participants who primarily worked in construction and trades, street market traders, domestic workers. Um, and that this in econ in economic impact was amplified by religiously motiv motivated discrimination, which reduced both their access to employment and to, st uh, and to the statutory services that they should have had available to them during the pandemic. So during the lockdown, um, on the other hand, during the lockdown, many Muslims and Christians did receive at least a little food assistance from their local place of worship, but didn't get anything from, from the state. Um, Dalit Hindus, on the other hand, received none as the temples closed and didn't offer that provision to their congregations, although some were able to, some of these Dalit Hindus were able to access government rations um, that are uh, available for people living below the poverty line. However, debt and harassment from lenders be became a critical issue as respondents were unable to pay their rent or had health costs and had to take out new loans, which was creating a great, so, a great source of stress, which I will come back to. I hope you have time to read those quotes as well. Uh, they are in the, in the policy briefs or in the report if you want to come back to them. So secondly, a second concern is about increasing discrimination and harassment. And as many of you will know, harassment experienced by Muslims in India has worsened and, and became uh, a serious concern or even an even greater concern during the pandemic. The Citizenship Amendment Act introduced at the end of 2019 provides a pathway to citizenship for persecuted religious minorities, but excludes Muslims. And this act has fed into a negative media narrative that has triggered verbal abuse, physical harassment, um, physical harassment and scapegoating of Muslims during the pandemic, um, including beatings um, and from police and so on, and which our participants experienced personally. We found that Muslim participants were reluctant to report discrimination to us for fear of reprisals, but did eventually share as the, as the group, um, as the, 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 the research group progressed and they felt more comfortable. And thirdly, there are longer, terms concern, longer term concerns triggered by these experiences of neglect and discrimination during the pandemic. And one such, um, and this, 
and mental, the mental health crisis is one concern about the longer term impacts. So driven by increased social isolation, distress and despair experienced by Muslims and Christians, but also acutely experienced by Dalit Hindus. And the government governmental response and protection very much as in the case of, of, of Nigeria towards lower caste and religious minorities has been insufficient. In addition, deepening poverty is increasing the likelihood of intergenerational transmission of poverty and exclusion, in particular the impact of the, of the pandemic on the education of children in families experiencing deepening poverty is that children have just missed out on at least a year of schooling. Families had to share one phone between all the children if they had a phone. In other cases, they gave up altogether and the children had no studying at all. And parents struggled to help their children with their studies, as many of the poorest parents did not speak any English. And the longer term consequence of this loss of schooling is the, is the compounding of poverty across generations, which in turn reinforces and deepens marginalization and stigmatization of these religious minorities. Um, and very finally, um, and briefly, <laughs> there were a couple of um, uh, a couple of uh, recommendations. One of which I, I I raised quickly with Fiona before she left. But the first recommendation is about criteria for assessing vulnerability. So we would like to recommend from the India research that, and I think this applies in, in, in Nigeria too, that vulner vulnerability assessments need to be adapted to context as well as to religion and gender, because the, the situation for, for many people experiencing inter intersecting inequalities today, religious inequality is often at the center when they are of a, a religious minority group and signifies great risk for them for, 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 for particular groups in particular contexts and it depends on where you are. For example, Christian and Muslim Dalit communities who are excluded from benefits in India um, when certain benefits are available to Hindu Dalits but not to Christian and Muslim Dalits. So it's important, important to understand the specificities of exclusion in context and both state and societal attitudes towards those groups. And the second recommendation that we wanted to highlight is that of, the, of support to faith-based organizations, because as the state retreats from, from supporting um, faith-based organizations, the poorest suffer because these are the organizations that step into the breach. And, and, um, and in India, the government has clamped down on faith-based organizations that were filling this gap. So we'd really like to see some kind of response to try and address this and, and, and support and get resources to faith-based organizations who are so important because they are working at the ground level. They know their constituencies, they're trusted and they can reach them when many others can't. And that's where I'll leave it so that there's some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Joe Howard. So we have a, a question uh, from Julia in the chat function, and it, it, it probably um, it, we'd love to hear from uh, Professor Fumi and Dr. Dauda. Um, to what extent are people's perceptions of discrimination, of inequality, reflective of the situation on the ground? In other words, when, when there's a perception that um, the government is privileging one party or one part of the uh, one part of the population over the other in the distribution of benefits and resources. Um, uh, that perception, or that a group is getting more aid than another, um, is is that true, or is that a is that a perception that is not informed by the facts on the ground? Now, uh, Julia, if I have not read your question correctly please jump in and correct me now. Okay, so I'm assuming I've, I've, I've understood the question correctly. So um, uh, Professor Funmi and Dr. Dauda can, can in one minute uh, each, of course, uh, share with us, is there a disconnect uh, between perception and reality on the ground? And if so, where does it exist or does it not exist? So let's start with Professor Funmi. In comparison to Muslims, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you for uh, the privilege of being a part of this research. I really have been uh, greatly motivated and, have, and enriched by it. And I thank you, uh, Dr. Joe, for summarizing our research in such a professional way and being such a great uh, inspirational leader throughout. Now, to the question. Oh, by the way, I have to correct. I'm not the leader of National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. I'm just the director of studies and the first female to be so important to correct that. Now to the question. Yes, indeed, uh, it varies. In some instances, there is evidence to suggest that those perceptions are real. Uh, for example, uh, it is very, very clear that uh, communities in Plateau State and in Southern Kaduna have been displaced. Uh, uh, Christian farming communities have definitely been displaced, uh, attacked, uh, targeted as such. Uh, among Muslims, it is very, very clear that sometimes, particularly in Plateau State, being a numerical minority, uh, some of them do not have um, equal uh, access to various uh, 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 political resources. However, there is also, as a researcher, I must admit that some of these perceptions are linked to age-long suspicions uh, and sometimes a, a, a wrong interpretation of, of, of what is going on. I'll give you one example very quickly. Uh, throughout this period uh, during COVID, both Christians and Muslims have shared stories of feeling stigmatized by when they go to hospitals. So uh, what uh, Dr. Dauda said about Muslims being stigmatized, we also found stories like that among Christians. And this is simply because of the, the general fear and ignorance around COVID. Uh, and so a lot of people just got stigmatized just, you know, because of that ignorance and fear, not necessarily simply because they were Christian or Muslim, but there is that strong perception that it was because of that, because of age long, already rooted uh, um, suspicions among them. And there are many of such examples. So in a nutshell, I would say yes and no. Thank you, Professor Fonzi. Dr. Dowden. Yes, I think she has she has said everything, and uh, yes, but also um, I would like to add uh, one experience which is very important. I think at this moment, you know, when we went to the, uh, the bus community, for instance, the express is happening, and in addition to that, they also express the kind of persecution that they were, they went through from the neighboring uh, community, but then. Um, I Dr. Dauda, I think something's happening with the volume. We're not able to hear you well. There's a, an echoing. I think that's better. Let's try again now. Okay. Mm. Yes, so... so the, the, the My, okay now? Okay. So the community expressed uh, the kind of persecution, the kind of... Uh, um, the situation they are, they are in. And so we, we ask them whether they can approach the government uh, so the government can come to the need for, they said the government can't do anything. They have done this several times, but nothing happens. So when I came back to Joss, I, I went to the, uh, I, met, I, I met the Joss Not uh, chairman and, and told him about this community. And, and um, I really even advised him that, look, um, to avoid any conflict between these communities. I think there is need for urgent intervention, but the government did nothing until the recent uh, outbreak of violence with, uh, uh, between the two communities. Thank you very much, Dr. Dowden. I think that probably also answers partly uh, Daniel's very important question about government policy is that there is an inaction on the part of governments in responding to these increasing um, gaps. Um, and just as Dr. Dowd was saying now, he actually sought to, to, to alert them to uh, this, uh, this growing intensity of, of, of experiences and, and yet there was inaction. Uh, Dr. Joe, I, I wonder whether you want to comment on Indian government's policy because they have uh, been very keen on uh, on, on saying that they have a, a response to COVID um, for all Indians. Um, were there particular recommendations to the Indian government? Joe, you're on mute, sorry. Thank you. 
Thank you, Maurice. I think in the interest of time, because we only have four minutes, I would direct you to the India policy briefing, which I hope everybody has, and that there are a number of, of recommendations, um, both to international and to national policy. Um, but um, what comes to mind to me as well is, is about policy towards the media and a lot of the um, hostility and um, violence towards um, Muslims in particular in India has been fueled by the media. And so a stronger, a stronger control uh, of responsibility towards what the kind of messages that are put out in mainstream media, and we know social media is, is so difficult to control, but um, I would like to add that as a consideration. Thank you so much. And, and, and what you referred to and what Professor Fonmi referred to, um, the policy briefs. So uh, we will be um, making available on our website uh, tomorrow three things, the full report and two policy briefs, uh, one on India and one on Nigeria, which um, as uh, uh, Professor Funmi and Dr. Well, here we are. So these are examples of them. They uh, succinctly summarize the key policy recommendations for both countries. And um, for those who have kindly um, put in the chat function uh, their email addresses, we will certainly make sure that um, they are sent to you tomorrow. And of course, the, in, the full interventions of all speakers will be made available tomorrow um, online. And um, you can um, um, also uh, send to us at creed at IDS dot ac uh, dot uk with queries that we may not have had a chance to take on um, now but that we will certainly i think uh, everyone's committed to answering any questions you have so do feel free to connect with questions and our panelists will as much as they're able to um, 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 get share back um, um, in response to queries so thank you everyone for joining us and um, Thank you for uh, your interest in this. And of course, as mentioned, independently whether you're working in Nigeria or India, there is so much value in, in being with people on their journey um, uh, through participatory methods that leave something in the community as well. So do not, he do not uh, hesitate to get in touch with us if you are uh, doing your work elsewhere but um, uh, you are interested in knowing more about participatory methodologies for understanding in religious and intersecting inequalities. Thank you everyone for joining and have a wonderful morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you so much. And of course, thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you, uh, of course, to uh, Dr. Joel, to, doc to Professor Fonmi, to Dr. Dauda. Um, an enormous thank you to Emily and Alice for kindly facilitating and enabling uh, this seminar. And uh, thank you for, for everyone who's joined us today. Much appreciated. Thank you. So good to be here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, -bye. Bye.